In 1985, less than 15% of Americans were obese. By 2014, that number more than doubled to 38% of adults. What is happening in the U.S. is happening worldwide, and it's affecting children as well as adults. These trends threaten our health and our well-being. They increase the risk of diabetes, heart disease, and cancer, and take away our ability to do the activities we enjoy most. If trends continue, children today could be the first generation in two centuries to live shorter, less healthy lives than their parents. What accounts for these trends? How can we take back control over our weight and our health? Solutions to the obesity epidemic have focused on balancing calories and on finding the optimal proportion of carbs, fat, and protein that best support weight loss. These are solutions that at best lead to short-term success. However, over the last three decades, scientists have made exponential progress in unraveling the root causes of obesity. The picture that is emerging is that obesity is a complex whole body disease, one that involves our brain, gut, hormones, and emotions. Our solution needs to be equally comprehensive and needs to move beyond calories, macronutrients, or exercise in isolation. For the first time, we're able to make unprecedented progress in finding sustainable and health-promoting solutions to weight loss. At the forefront, we're discovering answers to long-standing, fundamental questions, such as how much of obesity is due to a lack of willpower, how much is genetic, how much is due to our environment, Currently, most weight loss plans focus on willpower, on how you can restrict your diet to lose weight. They fail to take into account the complexity of obesity and decision making, or how our genes, hormones, and mind and emotions respond to our environment to make us susceptible to becoming obese. They overlook the critical fact that many of our food decisions are made before they reach our awareness and are influenced by emotions, the reward we anticipate from that food, and cues in our environment, such as seeing and smelling freshly cooked food. This course offers a weight loss solution beyond simply restricting calories, blaming different macronutrients, focusing on individual willpower, and stigmatizing obesity. I hope to share what we know about obesity, problem solve together to create individualized weight loss plans and support each other in the challenge. I hope that you will join us on this journey so that you can better understand the biologic challenges to weight loss, find personal strategies that unlock the root causes of obesity, and find your path to sustainable health. In 2016, researchers at the National Institute of Health shocked the world when they published results of what would be dubbed the Biggest Loser Study. After following 14 out of 16 contestants from season eight of the popular show for six years, they had made a surprising observation. Even though six years had passed since the end of the competition, their bodies were still fighting back to regain the weight they had worked so hard to lose. By the end of the 30-week contest, the average resting metabolic rate or metabolism of the contestants was 600 calories per day slower than at the start of the competition. That, however, was expected. When a person loses weight, he or she loses muscle as well as fat, and as a result, metabolism slows. Six years later, most of the contestants had regained some of the weight they had lost, so their metabolism was expected to recover in proportion to their body composition. Yet instead, their metabolism slowed even further. The average resting metabolic rate of the contestants was 500 calories per day slower than someone who was at their same weight and with the same amount of muscle and fat mass who had never lost such a massive amount of weight. This difference between their expected metabolism based on their body composition and their measured metabolism is called metabolic adaptation. It represents the degree to which the body fights back against hard-earned weight loss, even six years later. If these individuals, who had the support of the world's best trainers and nutritionists, couldn't succeed at sustained weight loss, what does that mean for other people struggling with weight who don't have these resources? 
a flurry of headlines debated these questions. Five years prior, another groundbreaking study published in the New England Journal of Medicine had made another peculiar observation that changed the way we view obesity. Rather than looking at calories we burn after weight loss, these researchers looked at calories we take in, or our hunger level after weight loss. They placed 50 obese and overweight people on a very low calorie diet of 500 to 550 calories per day for 10 weeks. They measured each participant's appetite hormones at the start, after the 10-week diet, and then a year later. Following weight loss from the very low calorie diet, these participants had a higher amount of the appetite hormone that signals hunger, called ghrelin, and a lower amount of the appetite hormones that signal satiety. Their brains were getting the signal that they were hungrier and less satisfied after eating to drive their weight back up and this lasted a year later. Like the Biggest Loser study, what they were seeing is that our bodies somehow fight back against weight loss. The authors concluded the high rate of relapse among obese people who have lost weight has a strong physiologic basis and is not simply the result of the voluntary resumption of old habits. Understanding how and why and finding ways to overcome these strong compensatory responses is the reason most people struggle with their weight. It's the reason weight regain or yo-yoing is so common after weight loss. But rather than viewing this as a failure, we're learning that our bodies are fighting hard to drive us to regain weight. Our body continues to send signals that are hard, sometimes impossible to fight. Losing weight successfully requires a reprogramming of these signals. This has become the holy grail of obesity research. Over the coming weeks, I wanna share with you the things we have learned so far. The take home is that managing your weight as a balancing act between calories in versus calories out is important, but simply outdated. Sustained weight loss is far more complicated. What I hope you will learn from this course is a far more comprehensive strategy. The decision to start eating, what to eat, how much to eat, and when to stop are all controlled in a tightly regulated system in the brain. Our brain gets signals from our body, from our stomach, digestive tract, and stores of fat, and translates them into action, to eat or stop eating. It coordinates these commands with our environment so that when we are hungry, we know where to get food, what types of food are available, and which foods are tasty and satisfying. You can think of the coordination of sensing when we need to eat and knowing where and with what to satisfy that need as being controlled by two brains working as one, integrated in a tiny part of our brain that acts as command central, the hypothalamus. You can think of the first brain as our metabolic brain. This brain responds to our body's needs by communicating between our gut and our hindbrain, the part of the brain that acts without thought as a reflex to the signals it receives from other parts of our body. For example, our stomach and digestive tract have sensors that detect when our stomach is empty or stretched and the type of nutrients that are or are not available in our digestive tract. In other words, these receptors sense the quantity and quality of food in our gut and communicate that information via nerves and appetite hormones to the brain. In response, our hindbrain determines when we should start eating and when we are full. What we conceptualize as the second brain is a bit more complicated. We can think of it as our emotional and thinking brain that responds to needs beyond calories. It helps us form memories of food which ones we like and which ones taste bitter or rotten, which ones we ate at a particular place or time, such as on a date or holiday event, as well as other characteristics about the food, its smell, look, and texture. It also assigns an emotional value to food so that we get pleasure and reward from certain foods. When foods are pleasing, we learn to like that food and the brain uses the same powerful pathways that respond to narcotic drugs to communicate that information. Foods that are rewarding motivate us to want that food. They are controlled by dopamine signals, the same chemical we release from gambling and sex. The emotional satisfaction we get from food is so strong that it can override our metabolic brain or the signals our brain receives that tell us we're full. 
Researchers speculate that our powerful drive to get such satisfaction from food was wired into our biology to motivate our ancestors to leave the safety of their caves, walk for miles, and risk encountering predators or toxic plants. The interaction between these two brains is complex and in many ways overlapping. They're nature's way of making sure our bodies fend off starvation, which was the biggest threat to our survival as the human species for most of our time on this planet. Starvation is rarely a problem in our modern world. We're going to see how our appetite and energy control systems aren't adapted for working to our advantage in our current food environment. That is part of the reason we are seeing such rising rates of obesity. Our appetite control system not only regulates our food intake in the short term, but our weight over the long term. It does this by sensing the amount of fat or adipose tissue we have stored. The body weight and amount of fat stores that our body tries to maintain is called our set point. You can think of set point like a thermostat for weight. If our weight drops below the thermostat setting, it compensates by increasing appetite and slowing metabolism until we regain the weight. The same thing happens when we gain weight. We feel fuller and our metabolism speeds up until we lose weight back to our set point. Given that for some people weight steadily rises, you may be wondering how can it be that we have a set point? Why don't these compensatory responses kick in to help us lose weight? Much research now indicates that in obesity, our bodies are no longer functioning normally. The set point ratchets up and our body fights hard to defend this new set point. In fact, our set point can steadily increase upwards or slide downward. It is not fixed. Let's look at two scenarios. The first, at our set point where body weight is normal. When a person with normal body mass index is placed on a very low calorie diet, he or she will likely lose weight. But once allowed to eat at will, our energy balance system kicks in to drive weight back to our starting point. The same happens when we are intentionally overweight. Once allowed to eat at will, we subconsciously lose appetite and our brain speeds our metabolism until we lose weight. In the case of obesity, set point rises in proportion to our body fat. The same defenses try to maintain the new higher set point. So even if weight loss is hard earned by following a diet, it becomes hard to maintain that weight loss. Our body acts like we're starving, even though we may be overweight. While often people who are overweight feel they may lack the discipline to lose weight and keep it off, Science is suggesting that obesity is a disease where our control systems become abnormally regulated around a higher set point and the body doesn't function normally. The main takeaway is that even though we focus so much on how our eating and exercise behavior controls how our body functions, the reality is that the way our body functions is what controls our eating behavior. While we view regaining weight and reverting back to being overweight as failure, what is really happening is our body is fighting what it perceives as the threat of starvation due to a higher set point. It's still frustrating, but understanding why this happens can help you understand how to work with your body to successfully lose weight and keep it off. Over the course of the following weeks, one of the things we're going to focus on is how our environment, not just our food, but also our habits, can affect our set point to lead to obesity. Targeting these factors will help get to the root cause of obesity so that you can create an individualized plan for managing weight long term. It's common to observe that some people can eat hardly anything and yet their weight stubbornly clings, while others seem to eat nearly everything and still maintain their weight. Why is that? How much of our body weight is luck or genetically determined? And how much is in our control? Through an explosion of genetic research, mostly over the past decade, scientists have found common genes that account for approximately 20% of the variation in body mass index across the population. Each of these genes only makes a tiny difference in our body weight, and we each inherited a different combination of these genes. Our mix of genes ultimately determines a small proportion of body weight. 
this is the part over which we have little control. What is the function of these genes? Interestingly, they mostly correspond to functions in our brain, influencing areas that play a role in our appetite and energy control systems. Some of these genes, for example, may affect the reward or pleasure we get from food. Others may determine how quickly we send hormones that tell the brain we are full. Depending on the combination of genes we get, our experience with food may be different. How we taste food and the pleasure we get from it may be different. It may be easier or harder for you to avoid chocolate cake or stop eating even when you know you're full than it is for me. What that also means is that we each have a different predisposition to obesity. It means that obesity isn't one disease. There are many subtly different types of obesity caused by different subsets of these genes. While that may be surprising, it's really no different from what we're learning through genetics about other common diseases such as diabetes, high blood pressure, and depression. Each is not one disease, but many similar diseases, which explains why each person responds differently to medications for these conditions. Since the genes discovered to be associated with body weight control our susceptibility to obesity, the drivers that lead to becoming overweight or obese are different from person to person. As a result, the diet or any other approach to weight loss for that matter that works for one person may not work for another. There is no one size fits all answer to weight loss. Our goal is to help you find what unlocks your success. Since the genes that have been discovered to affect our body weight control only a small proportion of the differences seen in body mass index, the good news is that we can determine most of our body weight through choices we make and through shaping our environment. In other words, most is in our control. The fact that our genes haven't changed much since the 1980s, but rates of obesity have skyrocketed, reinforces this idea. With that background, let's dive deeper into the changes in our food as well as other changes in our environment that have been making managing weight so challenging and what we can do to manage obesity. Americans are consuming approximately 500 calories more per day than they did in 1970. According to the USDA Economic Research Service, in 1970, Americans consumed around 2,039 calories per person per day. By 2010, that amount increased to 2,536 calories per person each day. Why the increase? And what types of calories account for the rise? The USDA estimates 87% of the additional calories we are eating are from grains, added oils and fats, and added sugars and sweeteners, all calorie-dense ingredients commonly found in processed foods. Unfortunately, only 2% are from eating more fruits and vegetables. How did grains, fats, and sugars creep into our food supply? Many advances in food processing technology during the latter half of the past century have rapidly changed the typical Western diet. With the discovery of chromatographic fructose enrichment technology, High fructose corn syrup began being made in massive quantities and added to many staples. Grain started being milled. Since milling grain strips the fiber coating and many of the nutrients from whole wheat, this led to widespread use of highly refined grain flours that are lower in nutritional quality. Industrial processing also allowed for refining vegetable oils in larger quantities than ever before and more salt entered our diet, resulting in 75% of the salt that we consume now coming from salt added to processed foods. The standard American diet has gradually changed to one where 62% of our calories are from processed foods. As a result, we're consuming more calories but getting fewer nutrients. If we think back to how our metabolic brain works, we can better understand why refined grains and added fats and sugars cause us to overconsume calories. We eat until the stretch receptors in our stomach reach a particular volume of food rather than until we have eaten a set number of calories. Since processed foods are concentrated in calories, 
and are low in bulky fiber, we consume more calories before our stomach senses we are full. Additionally, our stomach and digestive tract sense a certain threshold of nutrients. We stop eating based on the quality as well as the quantity of food. Since processed foods lack the nutrients of natural foods, lower nutrient density is another reason we are packing in more calories. The most alarming reason scientists speculate processed fat, sugar, and refined grains are causing rampant rates of obesity, however, is independent of their calorie content. They cause changes in our metabolism and hormones that raise our set point. In animal studies, for example, when rodents were fed a high saturated fat diet, they developed inflammation and injury in nerve cells located in the hypothalamus, which you may recall is the part of the brain that acts as command central for our appetite and energy regulation. The injured cells became leptin resistant or unable to sense the appetite hormone leptin, which signals when we are full. As a result, rodents ate to the point where they packed on more fat and drove up their set point. Some evidence suggests the same may be happening inside our bodies. Another way processed foods can raise our set point is by overstimulating the reward center in our brain. Remember how our cognitive and emotional brain works? It responds to pleasure from foods that raise dopamine, namely fat, sugar, and salt. Back in ancestral times, the foods that gave us such intense satisfaction were limited. Sweet tasting honey was only available seasonally. We could only get a small amount of fat from animals that roam wild and free, and salt was only available near water. It made sense for our bodies to get such a thrill from these foods to stay motivated to continue searching for food when we were starving and weak. Today, processed foods are engineered to give an amount of pleasure and reward that is far beyond that found in natural food. Food scientists blend the perfect proportion of fat, sugar, and salt to find a bliss point, the point where a product has the maximum texture, feel, and taste to release the highest amount of dopamine. This quality makes it irresistible, so you can't stop at one chip. Animal studies suggest processed foods reward our brains far beyond the amount we can genetically handle. As our reward system gets overwhelmed, we binge when we eat junk food. This is thought to be another way we are driving up our set points. In summary, processed foods are high in calories relative to volume and lack many vitamins and nutrients. They also contain unhealthy fats and sugars that interact with our brain to cause overeating. Avoiding processed foods is one of the most important steps you can take for maintaining a healthy body weight. Just as important as knowing what to avoid is knowing which foods you should eat. To lose weight healthily and keep the weight off, you need a dietary pattern that you can follow your whole life. You need to eat foods that give you all of your essential nutrients without leaving you hungry. And you need foods that provide you with strength, energy, and creativity. The types of foods that can do this are whole foods. What exactly are whole foods? These are foods that are closest to their natural form, similar to the ones our ancestors ate. For example, fruits, vegetables, beans, nuts, and seeds are whole foods. They aren't packaged in a box. They don't come with a nutritional label. They don't contain additives or preservatives, and they don't include a long list of ingredients. Whole foods are bursting with natural flavors, so you never have to feel deprived, and there are many different whole foods from which to choose. You can combine and pair them in a limitless number of recipes to match your tastes and preferences. An abundance of studies concur that eating a whole foods dietary pattern is the safest way to manage your weight. Eating whole foods isn't a diet per se, it's a lifelong framework for which foods you should eat and which ones you should avoid. There isn't a set meal plan you have to follow and you don't have to count calories. When you eat whole foods, you can know that with every bite, you're feeding your body the most nutritious foods on earth. The reason whole foods help with weight loss is that when they enter our body, they have a very different effect than processed foods. Unlike processed foods, whole foods naturally control your portions. They do this because they're low in calories per volume and high in nutrients. You can eat a lot of food for not a lot of calories. 
you can keep eating until you're satisfied. They're also high in fiber, which adds bulk and keeps you full. Whole foods also contain natural amounts of fat, sugar, and salt. They don't override your appetite hormones and drive you to eat past the point of feeling full. Another advantage of whole foods is that they regulate your weight set point in a healthy range. If you recall, the biggest culprits in driving up set point are saturated fat and refined carbohydrates. Saturated fats are found mostly in animal and dairy products, such as beef, pork, cheese, and butter, as well as in processed baked goods and fried foods. Refined carbohydrates include processed grains that have been stripped of their natural fiber and vitamins, as well as sugars. Muffins, many breads, cereals, pasta, and desserts are examples of products with refined carbohydrates. On the other hand, plant-based whole foods with minimal lean meats and low-fat dairy allow you to consume different types of fat and carbohydrates. They provide healthy fats, such as mono and polyunsaturated fats, and high-quality carbohydrates, such as whole grains, vegetables, and legumes. As a result, by eating whole foods that are mostly plant-based, you won't ratchet up your set point. The higher quality of fats, carbohydrates, and proteins in whole foods also prevent and even reverse many diseases, ranging from diabetes to heart disease and cancer. Plant-based whole foods contain health-promoting chemicals found only in plants called phytonutrients. These include antioxidants and anti-inflammatory compounds, as well as ones that can turn on good genes and turn off our bad genes. The fiber in many plant-based whole foods also feeds our good gut bacteria. By reducing oxidative damage and inflammation, populating our gut with diverse good bacteria, and controlling how we express our genes, whole foods keep us healthy and living longer. A whole food, mostly plant-based diet includes some of these. This week's challenge is to eat whole foods as much as possible. Low-fat, high-carb, low carb, high protein. Even when choosing whole foods, is there a proportion of macronutrient, which are the carbohydrates, proteins, and fats that is best? For the last 50 years or so, many studies have evaluated diets based on the content of their carbohydrate, protein, and fat. And each macronutrient in turn has been blamed for the rise in obesity. Historically, out of an intuitive notion that fat must be making us fat, Low-fat diets became popular in the 1970s. Between 1980 and 1997, dietary fat as a percentage of total calories decreased from 41% to 37%. Anything low-fat was considered healthy, including low-fat cookies and low-fat ice cream. Despite many low-fat options hitting the grocery shelves, rates of obesity steadily rose. A closer look at the American diet during that time shows that even though fat as a percentage of calories decreased, the total amount of fat we were eating didn't change. Instead, we began consuming more calories. In other words, we never really went low fat. What happened is that we became so focused on fat that we stopped paying attention to other macronutrients. Many low fat foods replace fat with unhealthy carbohydrates sugars, and refined flours. And our intake of these processed carbohydrates and our total calorie intake soared. In response, many low-carb diets became popular. And since then, many different diets, including fad diets, continue to hit the market, each claiming to be the best. In 2009, researchers at Harvard tried to end the debate. They carried out the largest ever highly regarded randomized clinical trial in which participants were assigned to diets with different proportions of fat, carbohydrates, and protein and were followed closely for two years. While the average weight loss from the various calorie balanced diets was three to four kilograms, the amount of weight loss was similar in all the groups. People on low carb diets did just as well as people on high carb diets and people on low-fat diets did just as well as those on high-fat diets. While it may seem counter to popular perception, the authors concluded, and what has been seen in other studies, is that you can lose weight on many different diets with different proportions of fat, carbohydrates, and protein. The key takeaways from this large Harvard study are, first, 
It's not the quantity, but rather the quality of fat, carbohydrates, and protein that matters for weight loss and health. Higher quality or healthier fats, for example, are monounsaturated or polyunsaturated fats rather than saturated or trans fats. Higher quality carbohydrates are ones that are from whole foods packaged with fiber, such as vegetables, fruits, and legumes, rather than ones that are processed. In general, choosing whole foods matters more than worrying about your intake of protein, carbs, and fat. Second, the best plan for you is one that you can stick with long-term, one that matches your preferences, traditions, and customs. Don't look for programs that are so strict or so limiting that you can only follow them for a few weeks. In the Harvard study, participants that were able to stick to their healthful diet no matter the proportion of protein, carbs, and fat, lost the most weight. Observations from different cultural diets around the world reinforce these findings. In fact, some of the healthiest diets around the world vary dramatically in their proportion of each macronutrient. The Okinawan diet, followed by the Japanese in this longevity hotspot, is high in carbohydrates. On the other hand, the heart and waistline healthy dietary pattern followed by the people in Mediterranean countries is high in fat. Using genetics, however, the latest science is showing that there's a twist to these two major principles. In 2016, the same researchers that carried out the large Harvard study went back and re-evaluated how participants responded to the different diets based on whether they carried a particular gene that affects energy balance and fat metabolism. They observed that how each participant responded to the varying proportions of the fat, protein, and carbohydrates differed significantly based on whether or not they carried this gene. Therefore, while among all people that follow a diet that is low carb or low fat, the average response is not significantly different. The response in each person does vary considerably. In other words, no healthy diet stands out as best for everyone. The diet that works best for each person can vary significantly based on our genes. Referred to as the weight loss trap, this idea that each of us responds differently to different diets made the cover of Time Magazine in May 2017. Frustrating as the headline suggests, it's important not to miss the forest for the trees. It's not that there are no diet rules, and it's not that diets don't work. We all do better with a healthy pattern of eating with plenty of fruits and vegetables than with junk food and processed foods, no matter our genetic makeup. But within this theme of healthy eating, it may take some trial and error and persistence to find the proportion of fat or carb that makes weight loss more manageable and sustainable. In summary, don't give up if you don't lose any weight following the same plan that worked for your friends or family members. Failing several times is normal. Focus on eating clean, whole food, avoiding processed foods, and trying different proportions of protein, carbs, and fat. And eventually, you will be successful.